Okay. The insurance company found that on average, over the period of 10 years, 23% of drivers in a certain zip code who had an accident one year also had an accident the following year. Um, only 11% of those not involved in an accident one year had an accident the following year. Using these stats as empirical probabilities, uh, draw the transition diagram, find the transition matrix P, and answer this question. 5% of drivers in the zip code had an accident this year. What's the probability that a randomly selected driver will have an accident the following year and the year after? So, uh, let's A. How many states do we have here? Yeah? Two. Two. So I probably call it accident and no accident. You can call it one and two, as long as you have something to represent accident in the year. No accident. So, uh, part A says draw the transition diagram. So, I have two states here. Boom. There's a lot of accidents here didn't have an accident, how does this look? <coughs> yeah? All right. Okay, so from the A to AC. And jump that way. What's point seven seven? People who had an accident one year who did not have an accident the following year. Point seven seven. Yeah? And line back the other way, AC to A. So they did not have an accident uh, one year, but they moved into a state of having an accident the following year. One, one, one. Then? In a circle from A to itself. Point two, three. Point two, three. In a circle from A to itself, should be pointing around. So that actually summarizes uh, the stats that we have here. Uh, so 23% of drivers who had an accident one year had another one the following year, which means that 77% uh, of them actually didn't have an accident the following year. 11% of people who didn't have an accident one year had an accident the following year, which means that 89% uh, didn't have an accident in two consecutive years. So that's what the transition diagram looks like. What would our transition matrix look like? Driver will have an accident the next year. 
What did you do here? Yeah? Um, I have the matrix 0.05 and 0.95 times the transition matrix. So this is the initial state. Uh, that reminds me of something I should tell you. Uh, so put A, if you look at uh, people in state A versus people in state A complement. 5% had an accident this year, so you put 0.05, which means 95% did not have one. So that's your initial state matrix. Right after. Remind me to say something about that. <laughs> Didn't do last night. Um, yeah, so then you did what? Uh, multiply by the transition matrix. Following year. Uh, what you would do is you would take S1 times P. P is on the right because matrix multiplication has to be done in a certain order. 0 0.05, 0 0.95 times this matrix. <coughs> so that is going to be uh, 0 0.05 times 0.23. Plus 0 0.95 times 0 0.11, 0 0.05 times 0 0.77, plus 0 0.95 times 0.89. See that's what you got. Uh, this is yeah. 0.116. 0.116, and the second one? 0.884. 0.884. This should be 1 minus that one. If you actually calculated this one, you would say 1 minus that answer, you would get this answer. Um, yeah, so this here, what we call S2, the second state matrix, and the first situation is A, A complement. So, What is the probability that a randomly selected driver will have an accident the next year? Alright, 11.6% chance. What about the following year? S2. Yeah, S2 times P. So you're just going to do that. after that, we're just going to do S2 times P, which is going to be uh, 0 0.116, 0 0.884 times 0 0.23, 0 0.77, 0 0.11, It's going to be 0 0.116 times 0.23. Plus 0.884 times 0.11, 0.116 times 0.77 plus 0.884 times 0.89 plus 0.19. company can 
um, since they've been collecting statistics over 10 years, can actually try to predict what's going to happen over the next year, the next two years, or the next 10 years, until they start updating their, uh, their transition matrix. Might get updated slightly over time. Um, on top of that, if they realize what is the average value that an accident would cost, then they can talk about the expected value of what it's going to cost them to deal with all these accidents, and then they can actually use that to determine your insurance premium. So that is the use of markup chains. And so a lot of these models will actually use that. Even most people at the insurance company might not know that this is what's going on behind those computers when they're striking the keys, but this is what's going on at some point behind the computers when you're striking the keys. Very efficient way to kind of set this stuff up. Okay, so that was problem three. Problem two, did anyone get anywhere with problem two? So two players, A and B, uh, they're playing a special type of basketball shootout game because it has very hard rules. Player A makes the shot about 60% of the time. Player B makes the shot about 80% of the time. And here are the rules. A goes, if A makes the shot, he's allowed to go again. So whenever he makes a shot, he gets rewarded, he goes again. If he misses, then player B goes. If B makes the shot, though, A goes the next round. So um, B has a better shooting at average, so I guess he's you know giving himself a handicap here. Um, so if he makes a shot, he allows the other guy to go. Uh, otherwise, he goes again. Uh, find the initial state matrix for this game after the first round. Find the transition probabilities. Um, and the transition matrix. Sketch the diagram. OK, so uh, what would you look for as the states here? Yo, yeah, well, how the round goes is going to kind of depend on the outcome of the shot. So that's why I would say there were four states here. One, two, three, four. I can say here A makes the shot. And A misses. Versus B makes the shot. <coughs> So who goes and the probability of what they're going to have to make the shot? Well, it kind of depends how the round is starting. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I would set up the states here. So there are two players, but there are really four kind of states the game can be in. You can start a round where it depends on if A was the winner in the last round or the loser, or B was the winner or the loser. There, there are actually four states here. Um, given that, uh, how do we actually set this up? It said find the transition probabilities and do the transition matrix. I guess you can do both of those at the same time. So obviously here you would have a 4 by 4 matrix. Where you can have state 1, state 2, state 3, state 4. And going across the top, state 1, state 2, state 3, state 4. Okay. So if you're in state one, how can you remain in state one? So suppose A, we're in a position where A actually made the shot. Right? Um, what is the probability that A makes the shot in the second round? Point six. We're in a position of A making the shot. What is the chances that we'll move to a state where A misses the shot? Uh, we're in a situation where A makes the shot. What is the probability we move to a state where B makes the shot? Huh? It's zero. Why is it zero? Because A goes again. If A made the shot, B doesn't get a chance. There's zero probability he's going to make it or miss it. There's two zeros here. 
Um, again, the rows must add up to 1. So here you have 0.6 and 0.4. You've already exhausted all your probabilities. So these are, without you even thinking about these two, it's auto they're automatically 0. Um, let's move down to another situation. Suppose we are in a situation where A misses the shot. What is probably that A will make the shot in the next round? Zero. Zero, because he doesn't get to go in the next round. So you also have a zero here. So A misses, what happens? It becomes B's turn. What is the probability that B will make it? Huh? 0.8, and the probability he'll miss is 0.2. Uh, here, you go from a situation where B actually makes the shot. What is the probability that he's gonna, that A will make the shot in the next round? So remember, when B makes the shot, he'll pass the ball to A. A is going to shoot, he has a 60% chance of making it, he has a 40% chance of missing it, and B doesn't get to go, and so those two are zeros. Um, in the event that B misses the shot, what happens? He gets to go again, right? Which means A doesn't get the ball, and the probability that B will make the next shot is 0.8, and the probability he will miss the next shot is 0.2. So that's actually a probability of uh, the transition matrix here. Uh, sketch the transition diagram. So, yeah. Uh, shouldn't you switch to row 3 and row 4? Uh, let's see. 3 is B makes the shot, right? Yeah. But doesn't he go again? No. Oh, okay. Right, no, it's, 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 it's a weird rules, right? So the thing is, if A makes it, he goes again, but if B makes it, he actually gives A a turn. Mm -hmm. the, the rules are here in bullet points. So if B makes the shot, he actually gives the ball to A, and A goes next, so that, that bullet points. So A keeps going as long as he's scoring. B, every time he scores, he passes it to A, and then he keeps, uh, yeah. So, transition diagram. Here we're going to have four points. One, two, three, four. Okay, how are we moving through these? And that's the last one. Alright, how are we moving through these points? So, one goes to one with 0.6 probability. So, a loop here, 0.6. Does 1 go to 2? The sphere 1 goes to 2 with 0.4 probability. Okay. Finish up, what's the next one you want to fill in? What? Right, which I'm not going to draw that because that's 0. <laughs> 1 to 4 is also 0, so don't need to do that. What's the next thing I'm going to sketch here? 2 can go to 3. What probability? 0.8. What's another option? 2 can go to 4. 0.2 probability. What other connections? <coughs> Three to one. Uh, that's point six. Another connection. Three to two. Uh, that's point four. Another connection. Four can go to three. Point eight. And well, four can go to itself. That's the markup chain for this system. Let's introduce uh, some other ideas before we move on to another uh, kind of problem. So. Yes. Uh, 
last time, uh, the this last time I, I mentioned that you call something a steady state matrix. If there is a state that if you keep repeating the Markov chain, is there some uh, list of probability states that we will all go towards and we'll kind of stay there once we get there? Um, I just want you to know that there are many names for this. I believe your textbook doesn't use the steady state matrix. I believe your textbook uses the term stationary matrix. So <coughs> just wanted you to know that those are the same thing. Um, other textbooks, might, you, you might also hear things like, uh, I think, equilibrium vectors, or another fancy name for it. I don't think you're ever going to see that phrase, but steady state matrix, stationary matrix, those are very common. Uh, I think your textbook actually uses this phrase. So we just want you to know that that's a thing. Uh, I want to talk about another kind of Markov chain, something that can happen. Sometimes it's possible for you to enter states that you cannot leave. Um, I'm not going to really give you an example of this, I just want to kind of draw maybe a picture or something like that. So there are things called absorbing Markov chains. So definition. absorbing state. If we enter a state and that state just loops around on itself and we never actually leave that state, we call that an absorbing state. There are reasons why we need to define that because sometimes we're looking at Markov chains and this behavior exhibits itself. Here's another definition. A Markov chain is called an absorbing chain. state and two it is possible to get from any non-absorbing state <laughs> it's called an absorbing chain. Now, let me just draw some examples. Don't really worry about what kind of example will actually yield this. However, if you're figuring out a problem and you end up sketching a diagram that looks kind of like this, um, this would be versus. So here, let's say we have here state 1, state 2, state 3. So something like uh, 1 goes to 3, uh, 3 goes to 1, 3 also loops back on itself, 1 loops back on itself. Let's say 1 goes to 3 with 2 thirds probability, which means it goes back to itself with 1 third probability. 3 is half and half. 
and two is just some isolated point out here connecting to itself with probability one. This means two is an absorbing state. But this is not an absorbing chain. Because if you're not at 2, it's impossible to actually get to 2. Somehow this system doesn't have a mechanism for jumping from state 1 or state 3 to state 2. So if you're over here, you can never actually enter an absorbing state. So it's not possible for you to go from a non-absorbing state to an absorbing state. So this is an example of a Markov chain that has an absorbing state, uh, but it's not an absorbing Markov chain. And of course you could draw the matrix for this, 1 goes to itself by 1 third, it does not go to 2, it goes to 3 at 2 thirds, 2 goes to itself with probability 1, it goes 0, 0, uh, 3 goes to itself with 1 half probability, it goes to 1 with 1 half, and that was zero. So that's an example of what the matrix might look like. Say you're reading a problem, you sketch the uh, transition diagram, and you see that something like this will happen, then this is an example of so one goes to two, three goes to two, these guys all connect. And back to itself. That. Suppose one goes to itself with one half probability, um, it jumps to two with one half probability, three goes to itself with one half probability, and it jumps to two with a quarter probability, it jumps to one with a quarter probability, uh, two goes back to itself with one probability. So here, two is an absorbing state. And this is an absorbing chain. Again, once you actually enter state 2, it's impossible to leave. However, every other state that's non-absorbing could possibly get to state 2 um, in finitely many steps. So this is called an absorbing chain. And those guys have a lot of well, both of these have their own application, but these are quite useful. Sometimes you enter a state and you can't leave it. So the markup, the matrix for this look like, again, 2 goes to itself with 1 probability. 1 goes to 1 with a half. 1 goes to 2 with a half, does not go to 3. Uh, 3 goes to itself with a half, goes a quarter, and a quarter. So we can talk about absorbing chains and non-absorbing chains, and you should be able to identify them. So uh, you sh I should be able to set up a, a, a situation tell you that, oh, we can interpret this in terms of a Markov chain, and then ask you, are there any absorbing states? Is this an absorbing chain? Blah, 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 because these things also have consequences. Let's look at some consequences. <laughs> Facts about absorbing chains. Turns out one. The P for an absorbing chain can be written 
in so-called standard form, standard form for an absorber machine, uh, namely, we always be able to reconfigure <coughs> the transition matrix to have this form. You can rearrange the states to look like the identity is going to appear here. Uh, zeros will appear here, and two other matrices, R and Q, will appear down here. So that's one fact. So let me show you an example. I think I wrote an example. I'm really sure. Itself, three only goes to itself, and four goes point three, point four, point one, point two. Is an absorbing chain. We can write it. things so that I get the identity in the top corner. So for example, uh, 2 and 3 goes to itself, so I'll put 2 and 3, rearrange it that way, and then just put 1 and 4 after, and then put 2 and 3, rearrange it that way, and then put 1 and 4 after. Uh, 2 goes to itself, doesn't go to anyone else. Uh, 3 goes to itself, doesn't go to anyone else. Uh, 1 goes to 2 <coughs> with 0.5 probability. 1 goes to 3 with 0 probability, 1 goes to itself with 0.5 probability, 1 goes to 4 with 0 probability, uh, 4 goes to 2 with 0.4 probability, 4 goes to 3 with 0.1 probability, 4 goes to 1 with 0.3 probability, and 4 goes to itself with 0.2 probability. I want you to notice that we can actually slice this matrix up into four sections. Here is the zero matrix. Here is an identity matrix, specifically I2. Here is going to be the matrix that we call R. And here is going to be the matrix that we call Q. I can actually reshuffle the matrix to look like that. Um, it, it will, the, the important thing is you might say that, well, couldn't I have done that with the other one? I want you to notice that the size of IN, the size of the identity must be equal to the size of Q because of something I'm about to see. So that if I have an absorbing Markov chain, I can actually write this transition matrix in that form. And so also, obviously, if you're given a matrix in that form, you should realize that you're looking at an absorbing Markov chain. And you should be able to identify the absorbing states. These are just the states that uh, give you the identity when you rearrange them. So two and three in this Markov chain are absorbing states. Another fact, two as n goes to infinity, your and p is the transition matrix. Of an absorbing chain. Then your matrix P will approach upon repeated multiplication by itself. 
uh, it will always be an n by n matrix, so you'll always be able to uh, multiply by itself. It will approach in the long term a matrix that looks like this. Um, it will have the identity here. It will have all zeros here and here. And down here, it will have a matrix big F times big R. The big R is the same R from here. So there's going to be some other matrix that you're multiplying this guy by on the left, where that matrix is given by the identity minus Q, and then you take the inverse. That's why they have to have the same size. You're going to subtract them, find the inverse, and you're going to put the end, and you're going to take that, <laughs> you're going to multiply by R, you're going to put the product here, and that will be the long-term transition probabilities. F is called the fundamental matrix. Basically, it tells you, F tells you. The probability of a non-absorbing state. Entering an absorbing state. long-term effects in an absorbing chain um, versus you should be able to recognize when something is an absorbing chain. You should be able to do configure the transition matrix in a certain form when it's an absorbing chain. You should be able to find the long-term state when it's an absorbing chain. I'll, I'll probably not ask you about this. You know, that's just an input. I'm not going to ask you to do that. With all this matrix multiplication, you're going to ask you to But just so you know, that's, uh, that's where the long term is going to be. But I'll have plenty to ask you about markup change before you get to that point. Um, yeah, it's, it's 11 away. We don't have to go too crazy. So, uh, no questions. So there's with another list of practice problems, like 20. I will also, I'll post that on the website that will help you study for the next test. It's like nine pages, so I'm not gonna, I didn't print it out for everybody. I wanna save the trees. However, for the last one, I wanted to do an example that I think is a really cool application of mark options. So, that we're gonna kind of figure out together. So see that.
thought experiment, I guess. So it's gonna you're gonna see a real cool way to use Markov chains, I think, which it's actually used this way sometimes. Um, consider this consider the chain. Draw chain for you. There are A, B, C, <coughs> D. <coughs> A is connected to B, B connects back to A, B connects to C, C connects back to B. C connects to D, D connects back to C, D connects to A, and D connects to E. So that's the chain. So now here's the what I'm going to represent with the chain. Um, so a, B, C, D, E are, let's say, torus estimations. The edges are roads, or pathways, whatever. They are show the directions you can move. A, B, C, D, E, you can think of these as cities. There is a way to travel from city A to city B and back to city A. There's a way to travel from city B to city C. From C, you can travel to city B. Did I connect C? I did connect C to A. You can also travel from city um, C to A. Uh, yeah, C you can get to D, D you can get back to C. And maybe you can think of these maybe even as airplane routes or whatever. Um, so um, you only have flights going from A to B, and from, that's it. So if you're at city A, you can only take a flight going to city B. So if you ultimately, if you wanted to get to C, uh, you'd have to first take a flight to B, then take a flight to C, right? If you wanted to go from C to B, you can get a direct flight there. C to A, you can get a direct flight there. C doesn't directly connect to E. Uh, if I want to get to E, there are a couple, uh, I can first fly to D and then to E and so on and so forth. So these tells you the paths that I can travel along in terms of the direction in which I can travel. Um, so that's the first thing I want to tell you about this chart. It's a graph that represents the, the travel routes between cities. Second, uh, there is an equal chance of tourists traveling along any path from C. Okay, so maybe I'm an air traffic controller or some city planner or someone who's concerned about the flow of people through all these cities, right? Um, and so the thing is I can't really predict who's going to travel where. I don't know a bunch of tourists flying to city A. I can't predict who's going to want to go to B or C or D or E. I don't know what's going to be on their minds of, oh, I want to see this tourist attraction or that tourist attraction. So I don't really know who from A is going to want to get where. So I don't really know. So as far as I'm at, you know what, there's an equal likelihood that anyone from any city might go to any other city and they, there's an equal number, a chance that they'll fly down any one particular path. So that's the, the next uh, idea. Um, one thing you'll notice here is that E looks like an absorbing state. Uh, But uh, here's the assumption, uh, if you enter E, it's not like you'll be stuck in that uh, city forever, that doesn't really make any sense. Uh, 
we would assume you will move to any other city. So there's a way to get from E to any other city, maybe by foot or whatever, <coughs> with equal probability. Except E. Is there anything with other rules I want to say? Okay, so here's our goal. You kind of understand how this map is being set up. Okay, so here's our goal. Uh, find the most popular destination. That's the goal. Um, so if we're thinking of this as a Markov chain, how do you think we can actually do that? What am I asking for, really? Sure, but more or less we want the, the stationary matrix if it exists, and we're going to see which entry of the stationary matrix is going to have the highest number, and that will kind of tell us where eventually in the long run do most people kind of want to go, so that's, that's the, the idea. Um, now, which city do you think is popular? Let me double check, make sure I drew this correctly. Yeah, so uh, what, do you, what would you guys guess? What's the most popular destination? A. A? What's your reasoning? Uh, it looks like there's more hours going to it than other cities. Yeah, A. One, two, three. There are three hours going to A. Yeah, that's a good guess. And that's more than anyone else? Uh, B. How many people going to B? Well, people can go along two paths to get to B. C. People can go along two paths to get to C. D. People are going along one path to get to D. E. There's only one path to get to E. It looks like A is going to be the most popular, but uh, let's actually make sure. What is the transition matrix here? So I do A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E. Okay, so. Uh, we have equal chance of traveling along any path. What does that mean? I'm in A. What are the chances of me going back to staying in A? None. Right? There's no chance. Uh, what is the chance that I would move to B? How many paths are leaving A? One, so just probably have one I'll hit to B, right? There's no way I can get to any other city. Okay. Uh, B, probably have B getting to A. What do you say? 0.5? Why 0.5? There are two paths from B. I can either go to back to A or I can head to C. I have an equal likelihood of choosing either path, so it's just half that way, half this way. So that actually makes sense. One half to go back to A, and there's a half probability that I will head to C, and yeah, I'm not going to stay to B. C. One half. There are three paths leaving C, which means there is one third chance of selecting any path. Uh, I can go back to A with a third probability. I can go to B with a third probability. I'm not going to stay in C. And I can go to D with a third probability. And I can't get to E. E. So I'm not going to go back to E. What are the others, though? Or do I? Did I want E? Because I, I don't think I want to go to zeros. Let's see the example. 
Didn't you say if you enter it, assume you'll retain the other city people probably? So it should be one. Oh, I skipped what? I, I skipped the line D. So D. Where can I go from D? <coughs> one third. There are three paths. I can go here, here, or here. So one third of the time I will go to A. I can't get to B. One third of the time I'll go to C. I won't stay in the same city. I'm a tourist. I'm going to travel around. And one third of the time I will go to E. E. I can move to any other city with equal probability. So what would this look like? One fourth, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth. That's what the transition is. Now, fun fact, you don't have to verify this. So notice that I have zeros all over the place. And so that doesn't really help me anything but here, fact. For this situation, I can tell you that p to the sixth, because I use Wolfram Alpha, has only non-zero entries. Or let's make it more specific, positive entries. So I raised that to the second part, I still had zeros. To the third, I still had zeros. To the fourth, I still had zeros. To the fifth, I still had zeros. To the sixth, oh, suddenly I was in a situation where I didn't have any zeros. What does that mean if our transition matrix hits positive entries? What does that tell us? Yeah? Sure. What does it tell me about the chain, though? Think of this as a Markov chain. What does that mean? part of the transition matrix has only positive entries. This was a definition for something. Right. This means the chain is regular. Okay. So what does it mean that a chain is regular? What can I say about this? There's definitely a stationary matrix. So basically, this is telling me that there is an answer possible, right? We don't have a situation under these assumptions where I won't be able to tell. There's definitely a way to tell. There's definitely a, uh, a stationary matrix, which means uh, basically now I can solve uh, S bar times P equals S bar for S bar. And ultimately, I will actually get, so again, um, it's a thought experiment. You don't have to actually do any calculations. I just want you to see something pretty cool. You can actually do this technically uh, in theory. And here is what you would actually approach. 44 over 149. Then you approach 56 over 149. Then you approach 33 over 149. Then you approach 12 over 149. Then 4 over 149. So that's the answer. That's Okay, so what can you uh, actually say here? So answer the question, what's the most popular destination? Huh? B. B is actually that you have a greater probability of heading towards B, and most people gravitating towards B. So out of 149 people, if I drop 149 random tourists on this map, 
Most of them are going to hit to B. Um, the second most is going to hit to A. Third most popular city is going to be C. So not only can I tell you the first most popular city, I can actually or arrange them. So destinations <coughs> in terms of uh, popularity. So, uh, who's most popular? B is actually the most popular. Then A. This is one, two, three. Then what? Then C, then D, then E, in that order. A, a cool application of Markov chains. Uh, so you can actually talk about the destinations uh, approaching different cities. There is something just as cool about this example, uh, by the way. Because you've all actually seen this in action before. Um, any, this reminds you of anything. Sure, yeah, but I mean, the whole, this whole strategy, I mean, right? You have something here. I mean, destinations, you're ranking them in terms of popularity. Reminds you of anything? So, I kind of watered this down, of course, because, you know, it's Math 1108, but, um, there are more complicated cases to consider, but essentially this is the essential, essential nugget and the functionality uh, of a very popular process. And basically what I just did was I told you how Google works. So back when I was a little Javon, <laughs> there were many search engines, right? There was like Alta Vista, there was WebCrawl, there was Axe Jeeves, there was like Lycos, there were tons of search engines. It was just anyone's pick. Everyone had a different search engine. Alta Vista happened to be my favorite. But everyone, you know, is like, you, search engines was like a jacket you could wear. You know, oh, I like a blue jacket. I don't know, I want my green jacket. And I have a long jacket, blah, blah, blah. And so there were tons of search engines. And back, way back in the day, before you guys were probably born, uh, people used to type in something into a search engine, and then all millions of entries would pop up, many pages, and then they'll scroll through the pages, trying to find something useful on the entire internet, which has like two trillion documents, and is growing by hundreds of millions of documents. It's like you have a huge library, and no librarian. You have to literally manually search yourself. So when I was doing a project for school, I'd be on like, Page number 23, nothing useful. Page number 24, nothing useful. Then one day, this is around 95, 97, I forget the exact year, but it's in the 90s at some point. This new kid on the block comes along, named Google. Someone told me about it, I went to the website, wasn't very impressed. All the other websites had flashy colors, clutter all over the page. There were very exciting pages, you know. Google, white screen, search bar, Google icon. Dismissed it. Eh, whatever. I'll stick to my Alta Vista. Then one day, uh, a school project got me sufficiently frustrated. I was on like page 49, and nothing was happening. And I was like, let me check out this Google thing. And lo and behold, on page one, hey, that seems pretty useful. Hey, link two is pretty useful. Link three is pretty useful. The first page had everything I needed for my project. What made Google different? Markup chains make Google different. You see, all the other search engines, they just look things up like a dictionary. Oh, you put in a search phrase, they literally search for every website that had that search phrase. No order. They just, the first time they find the website, they just, that's list one. This is list two. This is list three. Sergey Brin and Larry Page were working on Google and they were like, hey, remember that thing we learned in math class? That Markov chains thing? The thing that we were like, we're never going to use this in our lives? Dude. I think we can use that to organize our search engine. This is how they did it. You can imagine these cities are different websites and the lines connecting them are just web links. 
So someone can go to website A, there'll be a link to website B as a reference or whatever, they'll click it, they'll go over here, and then they can click and basically travel, you can think of this as the World Wide Web. It's a web that connects all a bunch of websites. So now when someone comes and clicks on a certain search phrase, how are you going to know which one is most useful? Well, the one that most people go towards and stay there, right? So there's a time where you can, there's a way that you can actually track how much time someone's spending on a particular website. Right, so, I search for glow-in-the-dark boxer shorts. Millions of websites have to do with glow-in-the-dark boxer shorts. But what is the most stylish glow-in-the-dark boxer shorts? Basically, think of the internet as there's create a web for glow-in-the-dark boxer shorts, and where do, what is the website that most people go to and spend money and time there? Oh, well, if this was the website for the, the web, the chain for glow-in-the-dark boxer shorts, the answer would be B. And you know what Google's going to do? That's search result number one. The next place, A, search result number two. The next place, Google is synonymous with search. Like, if you tell some, you want to tell someone search for it, oh, just Google it. Why is Google synonymous with search? Markup chains is the answer. This is the, uh, the thing that now, like, who use, does anyone who use Bing? I don't even know. Like, is there any other search engine really that people go towards? No, why is that? These guys, uh, and by the way, Markov Chains was invented like a hundred years before Google. So yeah, a hundred years ago, this guy came up with a theory, and Google figured out how to use it for this. <coughs> so I thought that was a pretty cool application uh, of Markov Chains. So every time you do a Google search, you're using Markov Chains. So you're like, I'm not going to use this math in my life. Dude, you're using it every day, multiple times a day. So, I will see you guys next time. <laughs> Have a great time seeing you. I will, by Thursday, I'll post the review for the next test with some practice problems, so look out for that. And I'll also post homework. <laughs>